Okay, thank you for introduction. And yeah, I'd like to thank all the organizers for uh, giving me this opportunity, uh, which turned out to be a quite unusual one. Um, before starting my talk, I, I probably I need to uh, emphasize a little bit that I am at Osaka University as shown here. And now that the University of Osaka has advertised in the web page or in emails because um, Recently, there was some announcement from two universities in Osaka, namely Osaka City University and Osaka Prefecture University. Uh, these two universities are going to merge in 2022, and the announcement was that they are going to use the uh, name University of Osaka as their official English name. So um, when you make a scientific trip to Osaka after this pandemic, and if you visit University of Osaka or Osaka University, you need to pay extra attention to which university you're going to. Okay. Um, well, traveling abroad sounds unrealistic to us now, uh, to us now anyway, but um, I hope that will be possible in not too distant future. Uh, okay. Um, what I'm going to talk about is the relationship between uh, something called asymptotically complex hyperbolic spaces that satisfies the Einstein equation and CR geometry. Um, this is one form of, or one instance of mathematical bulk boundary correspondence. Um, the term, the bulk boundary correspondence is originally used in physics and uh, perhaps it has some relatively specific goal in physical context, but um, I'm now using this term in a broader and probably big way um, just to indicate some uh, tight connections between certain non-compact complete Riemannian manifolds and uh, geometric structures naturally induced uh, on the boundary, um, on the boundary of infinity. So um, the non-compact complete Riemannian manifold is called the bulk here. And in our setting, the bulk is going to be an asymptotically complex hyperbolic Einstein space. Um, Okay. Uh, however, the case which is more enthusiastically studied is the one in which the bulk is a real, not complex, asymptotical hyperbolic space. So uh, I'm going to begin with that case. Um, in fact, I'd like to discuss the hyperbolic space itself, um, uh, which is of course the standard model for all those asymptotically uh, real hyperbolic spaces. Okay. Okay, so I put the picture on the left showing the hyperbolic plane, but um, of course we are interested in the hyperbolic spaces of arbitrary dimensions, n plus one denoted by n plus one. And um, there's, so here's uh, the Riemannian metric defined on the unit ball in Rn plus one uh, with which the ball becomes the Poincare ball model of the hyperbolic space. So uh, the Euclidean metric is divided by the square of one minus mod x squared. Uh, so the metric tensor blows up at the boundary um, to uh, second order. And uh, the normalization constant four is put here so that the sectional curvature of G uh, becomes constant minus one. Um, and in this case, there's a well-known fact that um, between the group of isometries of this metric and the group of conformal transformations of the sphere, uh, namely um, any isometry of this Poincare metric extends continuously up to the boundary and that extension gives a conformal transformation, conformal diffeomorphism of the boundary sphere. Um, a diffeomorphism being conformal means that uh, the pullback of the round metric of the sphere uh, by that diffeomorphism equals the round metric itself times some uh, positive value function. And uh, conversely, any conformal transformation arises this way as the restriction of the extension of some isometry of the Poincare metric. Uh, so in this case, there is a clear connection between geometry of the hyperbolic space and conformal geometry of the sphere, but I want to shed light to this connection from a different direction, um, from uh, analytic, uh, analytic perspective. Okay, so I want to consider the Laplacian um, of this metric 
Um, and actually, I want to discuss the Dirichlet problem uh, for this Laplacian. Uh, and for this Dirichlet problem, um, uh, so this Dirichlet problem is um, not so standard in that the boundary sits infinitely away from each point of the sphere. In, uh, I mean, each point of the space inside. Um, and for, in order to discuss the Dirichlet problem, it is convenient to use the geodesic polar coordinates first. So I wrote down the Laplacian in terms of the um, uh, geodesic polar coordinates. And the expression is minus t r squared, where r is the radial coordinate. Uh, which runs through between zero and infinity, um, and minus n times the hyperbolic cotangent r times dr plus uh, the Laplacian of the sphere, on the sphere, uh, divided by the square of the hyperbolic sine of r. And um, in this coordinates, the boundary corresponds to r equals infinity. So in some sense, the boundary is not visible or not approachable by, by this uh, coordinate. So um, I, uh, I want, uh, so we moreover set x equals e to the minus r so that x equals zero now corresponds to the boundary sphere. Um, then actually x becomes a boundary defining function of um, this unit ball, um, which means that gradient of x is not vanishing along the boundary. Um, then the formula of the Laplacian now becomes minus uh, x dx, the Euler vector field uh, with respect to x, uh, squared plus n times one over one plus x squared over one minus x squared ti uh, times x dx plus um, the Laplacian, the spherical Laplacian times four x squared divided by square of one minus x squared. Okay, um, so using this formula, we want to consider the, the Dirichlet problem. Um, so, okay, uh, let's suppose that we are given a um, function phi on the sphere. Um, and I want to discuss the construction of the Taylor expansion of a function u that restricts to phi on the boundary and satisfies the Laplace equation inside. Um, and each coefficient in the expansion will be um, a function of sphere two and it's, uh, they are denoted by F sub K. Okay, um, so we want to uh, determine those um, coefficients F1, F2, F3, etc. Okay, um, we can discuss this Dirichlet problem in arbitrary dimensions, but let me uh, discuss the case of four-dimensional boundary, five-dimensional hyperbolic space, um, because in this dimension, I think the discussion is easy enough, and also the result is going to be probably striking to some extent. Um, so uh, let's suppose n equals four, and the construction begins with computing the Laplacian, the hyperbolic Laplacian applied to phi, where uh, now phi is understood as extended from the boundary to inside in, uh, so I mean, uh, phi is extended in the x direction in the trivial manner. Um, then you can compute the Laplacian applied to phi based on the formula in the previous slide, and the result is 4x squared times the spherical Laplacian applied to phi plus eight times x to the fourth times the spher spherical Laplacian applied to phi and higher order terms. Um, so there are uh, second order term and fourth order term and higher order terms. And what we want to do is to um, determine um, the coefficients f1, f2, f3, et cetera, so that uh, these second order and fourth order terms are annihilated, okay? Uh, all right, um, so let's compute the Laplacian, hyperbolic Laplacian applied to the first order term. Next. Um, so this gives us, so the Laplacian applied to x times f1 equals three times x times f1 plus uh, eight times x cubed times f1 plus four times x cubed times 
spherical plus and applied to F1 plus high order terms. Uh, but this result shows that F1 must be zero because otherwise a non-trivial first order term, three times X times F1 will be introduced to the Laplacian applied to U and that cannot be removed by uh, higher order terms. So uh, F1 has to be zero by this computation. Uh, so next comes the Laplacian, the hyperbolic Laplacian applied to X squared times F2 and it's uh, four times X squared times F2 plus 16 times X to the fourth times F2 plus four times X to the fourth times the spherical Laplacian applied to F2 plus higher order terms. Uh, now we look at uh, the second order terms in the first line and this line and compare the, uh, yeah, compare the second order terms. And this shows that um, if we set F2, the function F2 to be uh, minus the spherical plus and applied to pi, then uh, the second order term vanishes. So this is the choice that we should make here. And uh, of course that function minus the spherical Laplace and applied to phi uh, is put into these fourth order terms as well. Okay. Um, and the next one is the third order term. Um, so, but um, in this order, in, in this third order, uh, if three again uh, must be zero by the same reason, uh, as for the first order term. Uh, so the Laplacian applied to x cubed times f3 equals three times x cubed times f3 plus um, higher order terms. And uh, if f3 is non-zero, then there is, there's uh, going to be a non-trivial uh, third order term in the Laplacian applied to u and that cannot be removed in, uh, by higher order terms. Um, so f3 must be zero. And the next order is the critical order in this construction. Um, the key point is whether we can use the, this fourth order term to annihilate the fourth order term in the Laplacian applied to U, but uh, the, the fact is that's, uh, that's not the case. So uh, if I um, apply the hyperbolic Laplacian to X to the fourth times F4, uh, the result is uh, that it's always uh, a large O of x to the fifth. And um, so there is no x to the fourth times a full term. And this means that, uh, so this order doesn't help us solving the Laplace equation. And the general construction of such a Taylor expansion of u terminates at this order. Um, and the already determined terms uh, give us the function phi minus x squared times the spherical Laplacian applied to phi and, um, and the hyperbolic Laplacian applied to this function is minus four times x to the fourth times um, the spherical Laplacian squared plus twice the square, uh, spherical Laplacian applied to phi and higher order terms. And um, this, the coefficient of this fourth order term has some importance, of course. Um, so if this were not true, uh, if, we, if this were not zero, then uh, the construction of uh, the Taylor expansion of U satisfying the Laplace equation is not possible. And um, the operator appearing here the spherical Laplacian squared plus twice the square, uh, spherical Laplacian is called the Panitz operator of the fourth sphere. And it is known that uh, this is well behaved under uh, conformal transformations of the sphere um, um, in concrete terms. This is uh, known to be a conformal invariant or conformal maybe covariant uh, differential operator. And the virtue of this, the characterization of the Panitz operator described here you, uh, using the Dirichlet problem uh, on the hyperbolic space is that uh, the conformal covariance uh, of the Panitz operator is an obvious consequence from the, fact, uh, from the construction, uh, from the fact that any conformal transformation extends to an isometry of the Poincaré metric. 
uh, which of course preserves the hyperbolic Laplace. Okay, um, so this is something I want to generalize um, to arbitrary um, conformal manifolds or CR manifolds. And now I introduce the notions of spaces or metrics that should fill inside of those conformal manifolds or CR manifolds. Um, the setting is the following. Um, uh, let's consider a compact manifold with boundary denoted by X bar and its, bound, it, uh, its boundary is denoted by M. And suppose that M is equipped with a conformal class of Riemannian manifolds or a CL structure uh, denoted by gamma. Okay. Um, if the, uh, okay, if gamma is a conformal class of Riemannian metrics, then uh, we will uh, fill the interior of X bar with uh, asymptotically hyperbolic uh, metrics. We say that G, a Riemannian metric in, uh, on the interior, uh, is an asymptotically hyperbolic filling of gamma when G is asymptotic to the model metric um, here. Uh, so dx squared over x squared plus h over x squared, where h is some representative metric of the conformal class gamma. Okay. Um, the meaning of being asymptotic should be made precise, but uh, I don't want to discuss it in detail, but um, because um, so I want you to take it naively and the meaning of this asymptotic uh, is uh, well, depends on the problem that you want to consider. So maybe I don't want to um, discuss it in detail. Okay, um, and uh, another thing I have to mention about this is that the right hand side, the, the model metric, um, makes sense, but uh, only after identifying uh, some neighborhood of the boundary with the boundary itself times some small interval like zero epsilon uh, in which x runs through, um, and x equals zero corresponds to the uh, boundary. Um, and so by saying that G is an asymptotical hyperbolic metric or asymptotical hyperbolic filling, um, we are assuming that there is some uh, identification like that. Um, and after, after fixing some, such an identification, uh, we can consider the model metric and uh, G, G is asymptotic to that metric makes sense. Okay. Um, okay, and uh, well, last remark about this is that there is no special choice of H here. Um, so the meaning of that is the following. Um, okay. Uh, if G is, um, or yeah, if this asymptotic equality holds for some choice of H in gamma, then uh, for any other choice of H, one can find an appropriate another identification, color neighborhood identification of um, the neighborhood of the boundary. Um, so uh, such that the asymptotic equality like this also holds for that different H. So uh, the boundary structure induced by an asymptotic hyperbolic metric is really a conformal class of Riemannian metrics and not a uh, not some particular Riemannian metric on the boundary. Okay, um, so that, that that is for the conformal case. And in the CR case, uh, we use asymptotically complex hyperbolic metrics instead. Uh, so the condition that G being, um, that G is an asymptotically complex hyperbolic metric is that G is asymptotic to uh, the model metric here, which is one over two times, uh, four times dx squared over x squared plus theta squared over x to the fourth plus h theta over x squared, where um, theta is uh, some contact form on the boundary, uh, uh, which has appeared in Professor Ebenhardt's talk, um, plus, um, and 
H theta is the Levy form associated to it. So it's D theta uh, dot comma gamma dot. Um, so, well, um, so actually we are considering um, only strictly pseudo complex CR structures here. Uh, then in that case, H theta is positive definite and the right hand side here, uh, the model metric here makes sense as a Riemannian metric defined near the boundary. Okay. Um, so these are the classes of metrics that we use um, in the bulk. And in order to establish tight connections between uh, conformal geometry or CR geometry and geometry or analysis um, in the bulk, um, it is desirable um, that the metric inside is more or less uh, determined by the conformal structure or CR structure on the boundary. Um, for this purpose, we additionally impose the Einstein equation for asymptotical hyperbolic or asymptotical complex hyperbolic feelings. So now we can formulate the basic problems of mathematical bulk boundary correspondence for these classes of uh, geometric structures. Uh, the first problem is to construct an Einstein AH or ACH filling for given gamma, uh, which is a deep and difficult analytic problem. And the second one is to analyze the asymptotic behavior of the Einstein matrix. And it has um, two aspects about this problem. Um, one aspect is, of course, um, that we really analyze the genuine Einstein metric, uh, but we can't start that until we have a genuine Einstein metric at our hand, uh, which is not achieved so often. Um, and the other aspect uh, for the second problem is that um, we can also consider um, formal asymptotic expansion of Einstein uh, AH or SH feelings um, possibly up to some finite order. Um, if you recall the construction of Panitz operator in, uh, on the four sphere, uh, you can see that only some finite jet of the hyperbolic, okay, um, you have do you have a question, Martin? Maybe not. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, construction of formal asymptotic expansion of the Einstein uh, of Einstein metrics makes sense because, um, so if you recall the construction of the Panitz operator on the full sphere, um, we used only a finite jet of the hyperbolic metric at the boundary. So um, if, yeah. So if we can construct a, uh, a, a, uh, an Einstein metric at the level of such formal asymptotic expansion, um, then that is going to be actually meaningful uh, for constructing boundary invariants. Okay, and the third problem is of course, uh, to construct boundary invariants. Uh, all right, okay. Well, so that's the basic problems about this mathematical uh, about boundary correspondence. And now, well, now I need to give you a um, supplementary explanation about CR structures that we are considering. Um, we have been talking about CL structures, but um, what we can consider here is actually a wide, a broader class of uh, certain, all, certain almost CL structures. Uh, so they, are, they may not be integrable. Uh, the reason is the problem. So uh, let, let us recall the definitions. Um, so, yeah, we have seen it before in Professor Ebenfeld's talk, but um, 
suppose them is a two n plus one dimensional smooth manifold and h uh, a h be a contact distribution over m. Um, uh, the notion of CR structures makes sense even if h is just a, a hyperplane distribution. But uh, we 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 consider only uh, the contact case, so um, we assume that h is a contact distribution in, uh, from the beginning, and an almost CR structure on H is a section of the bundle of endomorphisms of H uh, gamma, uh, which satisfies x squared equals minus the identity. So um, almost CR structures are, well, almost complex structures on contact distributions. Okay, so uh, in CR geometry, usually one assumes the integrability condition uh, for gamma, which uh, means that um, if we decompose the complexification of H by using gamma uh, and uh, denote the one of the eigen bundles by H10, then uh, the space of sections of H10 should be uh, closed under the, the Lie bracket. Uh, Lie bracket. Um, then, uh, so if this is satisfied, then gamma is said to be integrable or gamma is just called a zero structure. And uh, as I said in the previous slide, uh, we always assume that gamma is strictly pseudo-convex, uh, meaning that, uh, that its Levy form is positive definite, uh, d theta dot gamma dot is positive definite. Uh, but, uh, okay, and well, in order to talk about whether uh, the Levy form is positive definite or not, uh, one has to uh, one has to um, check beforehand if this is this bilinear form is symmetric or not. But uh, if gamma is integrable, then it's uh, the sufficient condition for uh, the Levy form being uh, symmetric uh, to form. Yeah. However. An important point here is that uh, for the Levy form being symmetric, integrability is a sufficient condition and not necessary. So we can consider a broader class of almost CR structures for which the Levy form is a symmetric to form and positive definite at the same time. Um, so in this case, in the literature, um, gamma is called strictly should convex partial integrable, but uh, in this talk, uh, we prefer uh, to saying that uh, that it is a compatible almost CR structure. Um, because um, in my opinion, uh, partially integrable sounds like the condition is a differential uh, condition, but the fact is that this is just a pointwise condition. So um, I just call it compatible almost uh, CR structures. Okay, so in this talk, CR structures should read, should always read compatible almost CR structure, right? Okay, now, now I want to, um, well, I started, oh, I used, 30 minutes already. Okay, now, now I want to discuss the problems mentioned in the previous slide, and um, I want to start it by um, discussing the construction of the level of formal asymptotic expansion. Um, the case of asymptotic hyperbolic Einstein fillings of conformal classes uh, was treated by Charles Pfefferman and Robin Graham in 1985, and the complete proof, uh, proof was uh, published in 2012. Um, for any conformal class gamma on the boundary, there exists, um, so depending on the parity of the dimension of the boundary. Um, if the boundary is odd dimensional, uh, there is an infinite order uh, formal asymptotic approximate solution to the Einstein equation. Uh, by the way, uh, the Einstein equation for asymptotic hyperbolic metrics is forced to be rich G equals minus n times G. Um, and if the boundary is even dimensional, uh, there is only an um, nth order formal synthetic approximate solution to the Einstein equation. And, and they are um, essentially unique uh, up to some finite order so that, so we can use this 
Kumar symptotic expansion to construct boundary invariants. Um, this essentially means that uh, uh, is due to the invariance of the Einstein equation of, uh, with respect to diffeomorphisms acting on X bar. Um, okay. And a similar theorem holds in the CR case too, so for arbitrary compatible almost zero structures. Uh, for any such gamma on the boundary uh, of some twin plus two dimensional compact manifold with boundary, um, you can construct a twin plus second order formal asymptotic expansion, um, which is a solution which solves the Einstein equation. And it's also uh, essentially unique up to some finite order. Um, so by using these results, one can invoke many constructions of boundary invariants, including uh, the Panitz operator, or more generally, conformally covariant GJMS operators on conformal manifolds, and uh, the corresponding CR version, CR covariant powers of the sub Laplacian um, on compatible or compatible almost CR manifolds. Um, the construction of such um, uh, CR covariant powers of the sub Laplacian for integrable CR structures uh, is due to uh, Rod, Rod Cover and Robin Graham um, in this 2005. Um, and that they used a different technique and uh, the approach taken here using the synthetically complex hyperbolic Einstein metrics has the advantage that it makes sense for arbitrary compatible OCR structures, okay? And next comes, uh, okay, uh, maybe I also want to uh, discuss a little bit about construct the construction of genuine Einstein metrics. Um, yeah, this is really a difficult problem and uh, construction for arbitrary boundary structure is far from no. So we only discussed the deformation uh, of a given solution. Uh, so, we have a we have x bar which is a compact manifold with boundary and the boundary is equipped equipped with some gamma naught which might be conformal structure and might be zero structure, and we suppose that the interior is equipped with an Einstein filling denoted by G naught, and uh, um, a deep theorem due to um, Graham Lee and John Roth and Olivier Bicar and uh, Jack Lee again <laughs> uh, is the following. So um, the, uh, we need one assumption. Um, if the L2 kernel uh, for the Einstein filling uh, of, the, of the differential operator uh, written here, so which is the linearized uh, Einstein equation basically, yeah. actually it's paired with some gauge fixing condition. Um, so if we suppose that the outer kernel of this operator vanishes, then any conformal class or compatible almost CR structure gamma on the boundary sufficiently close to the original one can be also filled with some Einstein metric. Yeah, and um, this is a, well, okay. Let me make two remarks about this. Um, first, the yeah, the assumption uh, about the vanishing of the outer kernel here, uh, this is uh, imposed uh, to guarantee the invertib in invertibility of the same operator considered on weighted held some weighted hurdle spaces. Um, okay, so the basic idea of the construction is the following. So we first uh, construct an approximate solution and then correct it by using some functional analysis technique. And um, so we need to control the asymptotic behavior of that correction term. And so we need to uh, work with weighted held spaces. And, uh, and the deep point about the proof of this theorem is bridging the analysis on L2 spaces and analysis on weighted held spaces. Um, and uh, so, yeah, this is, the place some deep analysis is needed. Um, yeah. And another, the other remark is that um, one needs to know when this um, assumption holds. And uh, there is an 
uh, mostly trivial um, criterion for this. Um, uh, sufficient condition for this. If the sectional curvature of G naught is negative or not no positive everywhere, um, then uh, it is known that this holds um, by some by some type of argument. Um, and but well, but it is sometimes impossible to uh, verify this negative uh, or non-positive sectional curvature condition for uh, abstractly constructed Einstein metric. So I proved the uh, following thing. Um, okay, so in order to explain this, uh, I have to mention the Chen Yao's Einstein uh, Kähler metric um, bounded strict relation complex domains. Uh, so for um, any bounded strict relation complex domain in CM plus one, uh, Chen and Yao constructed in 1980, uh, an Einstein Kähler metric with negative Einstein constant. And it is actually also asymptotically complex hyperbolic. So this is asymptotically complex hyperbolic Einstein Kähler metric. So um, we can think about its deformations. And my result is that this Einstein ACH Kähler metric uh, satisfies the uh, L L2 kind of vanishing condition, provided the complex dimension of the domain is uh, larger than or equal to three. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. So in this way, uh, you can get, so, uh, so originally the CL structure is integrable uh, for uh, boundaries of such a domain, but by deforming that solution, you can get uh, many almost uh, asymptotically complex public Einstein metrics for, um, non-integrable, uh, compatible serial structures. All right, um, okay, uh, well, maybe I need five minutes or something. Uh, okay, um, the last topic that I want to address is related to further construction of boundary invariants. Um, so in order to consider such things, uh, I want to pose uh, the following problem. Um, we want to find a preferable way to extend a compatible almost zero structures gamma on the boundary to an almost complex structure J defined on X bar. Um, there are some technical reasons based on which I thought that this problem is plausible. This is problem is not so strange, uh, but the time, well, due to the time limitation, I can't discuss that, so um, please be convinced uh, by the fact that um, in the Chen Yao case or in the case of strict relationship of omics domain, uh, there is, of course, a standard, uh, the natural extension of the boundary CL structure inside. Okay, so, um, yeah, and since I want uh, that extension, that almost complex structure J to be um, compatible with an um, ACH Einstein metric inside uh, G. Uh, I want to introduce the notion of ACH almost Hermitian structure, and which is the following. Uh, so a pair G and J is called an asymptotically complex hyperbolic almost Hermitian structure if both G is a Riemannian metric, J is an almost complex structure, and G is an almost Hermitian metric with respect to that J. And um, uh, uh, similar to the um, definition of ACH metrics, um, I assume that G, is, G and J are asymptotic some, to some model. So for some compatible almost zero structure gamma on the boundary, uh, G is asymptotic to the model metric for the, which is the same one for asymptotic complex hyperbolic metric. And J is um, asymptotic to a similarly defined model almost complex structure. Well, uh, defined below in terms of uh, its associated uh, holomorphic tangent bundle. Uh, but it, it says basically that J is an extension of the given uh, almost CR structure on the boundary. Okay, um, and the next thing, uh, well, I, I, I think uh, maybe I finished in three minutes or so. Uh, the next thing that I want to find is. Um, the 
equation in, uh, that should be imposed to G and J. Well, wait a minute. Okay. G and J. And for G, um, I continue to use the Einstein equation. And in order to find an equation for the almost complex structure J, uh, I want to introduce a functional in the space denoted by uh, curly J sub G, uh, which is the space of almost complex structures J for which um, G and J, the pair of G and J is an ACH almost transition structure. So uh, basically I'm considering all the almost complex structures, which, which is in some sense compatible with a given ACH metric G. And uh, I consider the following integral, the integral of uh, mod n squared, where n is the nine highest tensor of J, and one over two times the mod tau squared. And tau is, well, the trace of T, where T is a certain part of the different exterior derivative of F, where F is the fundamental two form associated to G and J. Um, one remark that I should make is that this integral is, well, in general, uh, diverging. So, but what we really need is its uh, euler lagrange equation. And you can consider the euler lagrange equation by considering compactly supported perturbations of J and considering its the relative values of this function. So the euler lagrange equation makes sense. And uh, okay, the result is the following. So now we have an equation for G and an equation for J. And the theorem is that, um, so there are two theorems. Uh, the first one is regarding formal synthetic expansion, expansion, expansion solution. And the second one is about the genuine solution. Um, and uh, the first theorem states that uh, you can construct the formal synthetic expansion of the solution to the system of um, the Einstein equation and the Lagrange equation for this functional of about J, um, uniquely, essentially uniquely up to some finite order. And the uh, uh, second theorem states that uh, a similar deformation theorem, um, a deformation theorem similar to Gram B of Picard's falls for this setting. Um, and so the needed assumption is that L2 kernel uh, vanishing, L2 kernel of the linearized operator vanishing. Um, um, but, um, okay. <laughs> uh, well, yeah. So, the one non trivial part of this theorem is that um, that vanishing uh, condition, that vanish the vanishing of the auto corner condition is satisfied, uh, is again satisfied by the chain yaw uh, examples of bounded strictly pseudo convex domains of uh, complex dimension. Uh, at least three. So um, actually this was my guiding principle in order to find the appropriate uh, function of OJ. Okay, uh, so maybe I stop here, but um, yeah, the obvious next problem is to construct, uh, is to give a new construction of CR invariants for compatible almost CR structures using these theorems. But um, yeah, uh, for this, I don't have an answer yet and I'm working on it. Okay, thanks. Uh, this is the end of my talk.